In the last lecture, we looked at the properties of atomic orbitals. But of course, if we're ultimately interested in materials, what we really want to know is how do those orbitals behave when we bring atoms together to form molecules, to form extended solids. Right? And to do that, we have to go one step further and talk a little bit about molecular orbital theory. So the idea of a molecular orbital is that it is going to behave very much like an atomic orbital. There's going to be a wave function for the molecular orbital, and that's going to describe the behavior of the electron in that orbital. We're still going to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Each molecular orbital can hold two electrons. But the difference is that the molecular orbital has the potential to stretch over the entire molecule. It's not confined to a single atom. And there's a variety of ways you might build the wave functions for molecular orbitals. The way we're going to approach it is to build up molecular orbitals as linear combinations of atomic orbitals. So you can see here if we call phi mo the wave function of a molecular orbital, it's going to be a summation of the different atomic orbitals in the molecule, all multiplied by a coefficient. All right, so let's illustrate what we might mean. The simplest and best-known example of a molecular orbital diagram would be that for the molecule H2. In a hydrogen molecule, we have two molecular orbitals. Down here at the bottom, we have what's called the bonding molecular orbital, and that results from constructive interference of the 1s orbital wave functions on the two hydrogen atoms. We know that that constructive interference is going to build up electron density between the nuclei, where they have the most favorable Coulombic interaction with the positively charged nuclei, and that's going to lead to a stabilization in energy. The bonding molecular orbital is lower in energy than the atomic orbitals of an isolated hydrogen atom. Well, we're also going to get an antibonding molecular orbital, where we have destructive interference between the wave functions of the two hydrogen atomic orbitals. Here, the color coding refers to the sign of the wave function. So the blue might be a negative sign of the wave function, and the red a positive sign of the wave function. So putting a nodal plane right between your two atoms is going to push the electron density to the periphery of the molecule, and that's going to be less favorable. The antibonding molecular orbital is going to have a higher energy than the isolated atomic orbitals of the hydrogen atoms. Let's redraw this using a slightly different symbolism that we are going to use the rest of the way out. Here, the orbital wave functions are both positive, and so when they overlap, it's going to be constructive interference. That's going to lead to a bonding molecular orbital. And then up here, we have uh, different colors for the two atomic orbitals, and that indicates that the wave functions have a positive sign on one side and a negative sign on the other. And so that's going to give us this destructive interference. Here I've used extended Huckel theory to come up with actual coefficients. And so we can see somewhat interestingly that the coefficients in the bonding MO are smaller than the coefficients in the antibonding MO. And that has to do with the idea that we're going to integrate over all space and normalize this wave function. And because in the antibonding MO you get cancellation, you actually end up with a larger coefficients. Another thing that's worth noting is that the energy stabilization of the bonding MO here for electron volts is smaller than the energy destabilization of the antibonding MO here, about 17 electron volts. And that's a general principle that the bonding orbital is always going to be stabilized by less than the antibonding orbital is destabilized. So it's never going to be favorable to fill both of them up. Right? If we filled up both the bonding and the antibonding MO, it would be more stable not to form a molecule at all. Let's take a closer look at the mathematics of what we're representing here. So if we were to 
plot the molecular orbital wave function along the intranuclear axis, we would get plots something like this. Uh, for the bonding MO, you can see that you have this constructive interference. On the other hand, in the anti-bonding MO, you can see because the atomic orbital wave functions have a different sign, positive and negative, they cancel out at z equals zero, and so we get destructive interference, and that leads to a, a nodal plane at this is z equals zero component. And because we've now pushed the electron density out away from the nuclei, this MO is going to be at higher energy. Okay, now let's look at different molecules with increasing levels of complexity. All right, so let's make the two atoms different. If we replace one of the hydrogen atoms with a helium, right, helium having two protons in the nucleus is going to have a much larger effective charge, and so the orbital energy of a helium 1s wave function is going to be lower than that of a hydrogen wave function. And so that's going to introduce basically a degree of ionicity in the bonding. Now instead of having a purely covalent bond, we have what we might call a polar covalent bond. And that shows up when we look at the wave functions for the molecular orbitals. For the bonding MO, we see we have a larger coefficient here for the helium than we do for the hydrogen. So the bonding MO now looks more like a helium atom than it does like a hydrogen atom. And we see the inverse case for the anti-bonding MO. Right? And as the orbital energy differences get larger and larger, the bonding MO looks more and more just like the more electronegative atomic orbital, and the anti-bonding MO looks more and more like just the more electropositive atomic orbital. And so in the extreme, that would just be ionic bonding. The other thing to note is that the stabilization of our bonding MO has reduced somewhat. Remember, for the hydrogen molecule, it was about four electron volts. Now here, for this hydrogen helium molecule, it's only about 1.8 electron volts. So another lesson that we take from this MO diagram is that when we start to overlap or mix orbitals of different energies, the degree of mixing is going to go down as the energy mismatch between the two orbitals increases. Okay, now let's look at something that has p orbitals. Let's look at an O2 molecule. And I'm going to first present the O2 molecule in a simplified form. And then we're going to transition from that to the true MO diagram for O2. Now, in the simplified form, we see that the two S orbitals can overlap to give a bonding MO and an anti-bonding MO. Right? So this lower part here looks just like the MO diagrams we had for H2. And then we have the two P orbitals that also overlap. Now, the two P orbitals are at a higher energy because when we talked about orbital energies, remember the 2p orbitals of oxygen are considerably higher in energy than the 2s orbitals. The 2p orbitals also overlap, not to give three bonding MOs and three anti-bonding MOs all of the same energy, but they're split into a 1, 2, 2, 1 pattern. And the reason for that is because along the intranuclear axis, we're calling that the z-axis in this molecule. The pz orbitals overlap head-on to form a bonding MO, and then head-on in the opposite sense to form an anti-bonding MO. Whereas if we looked at, say, the py orbitals, you can see that their overlap is side-on. So there's going to be less overlap for the py orbitals that form pi bonding and pi antibonding MOs than there is for the PZ orbitals, which form sigma bonding and sigma antibonding MOs. So the take-home lesson here is the more spatial overlap we have between two atomic orbitals, the larger the separation between the bonding and the antibonding MO. If we want to get to the true MO diagram for O2, we have to take into account another 
subtlety, and that is the symmetry of these various sigma orbitals is such that there can be mixing between the sigma 2p and the sigma 2s orbitals. So let's see what happens when we introduce sp mixing. If we concentrate first on the bonding MOs, here I've got the 2p sigma bonding MO and the 2s sigma bonding MO. And if we were to add these, we would accentuate the electron density between the nuclei, right? and that would stabilize this molecular orbital. If we were to um, mix them, let's say, destructively, if we were to subtract the wave function of the sigma 2s MO, and subtracting would be just the same thing as changing the sign of the orbitals, which we could capture by just changing the shading here, then what we would do is the opposite. We would diminish the electron density between the nuclei, and we would enhance the electron density on the periphery of the molecule, and that would destabilize this molecular orbital. So what's going to happen is that we're going to mix these two bonding sigma orbitals in a way that's going to stabilize the one that has mostly 2s character and destabilize the one that has mostly 2p character. And you can get the same thing if you talk about the anti-bonding sigma molecular orbitals. So coming back to our MO diagram, the sigma 2s orbital is going to get some p character, which is going to stabilize it. And the sigma 2p orbital is going to get some s character, and that's going to destabilize it. For the antibonding molecular orbitals, we'll have the same thing. The antibonding 2s orbital is going to be stabilized, whereas the antibonding sigma 2p orbital is going to be destabilized. The main effect this has is to reduce the separation between the 2p sigma and the 2p pi orbitals. And in fact, if we were to go to diatomic molecules to the left of oxygen, like nitrogen or carbon, this mixing would be enough that these sigma orbitals would actually move up higher in energy than the pi MOs. Okay. What if we want to go beyond diatomic molecules? I mean, in a materials class, once again, if we are only talking about diatomic molecules, we can't get very far. So when we go to molecules that have more than two atoms, the approach we're going to take is we are going to decompose the molecule into a central atom, and then we're going to take the atoms that are on the outside, these are, in inorganic chemistry, typically called ligands. And we're going to treat the ligands as a group. And then we're going to group the ligand orbitals by symmetry into something called a symmetry-adapted linear combination of ligand orbitals. OK, so let's illustrate this for some really simple molecules where we have hydrogen as our ligand. So if we were to look at beryllium hydride, BEH2, there's two hydrogen ligands, and so there's going to be two ligand salks. We can have one ligand salk where the hydrogen atoms have the same phase. We could call this a symmetric bonding combination. And then we could have one ligand salk where the hydrogen atoms have the opposite phase. And I think you can see by looking at the atomic orbitals on the beryllium that the first ligand salk can mix with the s orbital and the second ligand salk can mix with the px orbital. But the other two p orbitals, for every bonding overlap that exists, there's going to be an antibonding overlap. When that happens, we can say that they just have different symmetries. So all of this would come out of group theory. If this were a class in group theory, we would have gone over that, and we would talk about the labels. But here, what we're going to do as a shortcut is just use the visual that the PY orbital or the PZ orbital can't mix with these because there's no net bonding or antibonding overlap. Let's now go to a tetrahedral molecule like methane. And so here, now we have four hydrogen atoms and we get 
four different ligand salcs, and I've written them in such a way that they're going to have the right symmetry to mix with the atomic orbital that is to the left of them. So this one can mix with the 2s orbital on carbon, and the next three all have the right symmetry to have a bonding overlap with the 2p orbitals on carbon. If we were to go to an octahedral molecule, say something like the hypothetical SH6 molecule, now we have six ligands, each with one orbital, so there are six ligand salcs. It requires a deeper knowledge of group theory to know how we're going to draw these, but once they're presented to us, we can see that the first one is going to have the right symmetry to interact with the S orbital on the sulfur. The next three are going to have the right symmetry to interact with the P orbitals on the sulfur. And these last two don't have the correct symmetry to mix with any of the orbitals on the central atom. Okay, so these are going to remain non-bonding ligand salcs. Now that we've seen the salcs for a few simple molecules, let's look at the full MO diagrams of things like beryllium hydride or methane. So for BEH2, we've got our ligand salcs that I just described over here on the left. And then we've got the beryllium 2s and the beryllium 2p orbitals shown on the right. Beryllium has two valence electrons, so I put the two valence electrons here in the 2s orbital. And uh, hydrogen has one valence electron each. And because there's two hydrogens, we have two electrons there. Now, as I was just describing, we see that the sigma G salc can overlap with the 2s orbital on beryllium to form a bonding MO and an antibonding MO. Right? And so something to remember is whenever we have a bonding MO, we're always going to get a corresponding antibonding MO. We can do the same thing for the sigma U salc and the p orbital that is oriented along the internuclear axis. Right, and that's going to give us a bonding MO and an antibonding MO. And the bonding and antibonding MOs are higher in energy than those for the beryllium 2s combination with um, the ligand salc because the beryllium 2p orbitals are at a higher energy than the beryllium 2s orbital. Now, we've used two of the beryllium atomic orbitals to form bonding and antibonding combinations, but the last two beryllium atomic orbitals the 2p orbitals that are oriented perpendicular to the internuclear axis, they don't have any ligand salc to interact with, and so they remain non-bonding. So we call these molecular orbitals, but really in all intensive purposes, they look just like atomic orbitals. One last bit of nomenclature here. If we look at an MO diagram, some orbitals are particularly important in determining the properties of that molecule and those are the frontier orbitals. The highest energy orbital that is occupied, we call that the highest occupied molecular orbital, or HOMO. And the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO, is shown here. So in this molecule, the HOMO is the bonding interaction between the beryllium 2p and the hydrogen. And the LUMO is a doubly degenerate set of the non-bonding beryllium 2p orbitals. Let's go on to methane. Here in methane, we have four orbitals on carbon and then four ligand salcs. And because there's the same number of each, we can form a bonding and anti-bonding pair for every atomic orbital on the carbon. So we get this a1 molecular orbital, that's the bonding interaction between the carbon 2s and the hydrogen. And then here's the antibonding interaction between those orbitals. And then we have here these T2 orbitals. This is the bonding interaction between the 2p orbitals on methane and the hydrogen orbitals. And, and here's the antibonding analog to that. Of course, in organic chemistry, we would talk about methane having sp3 hybridization of the central carbon atom. What does that mean? Does that mean that we're forming some uh, sp3 hybrids and then those form bonds? And, and you might imagine in that picture that you might get four 
SP3 bonding MOs and four SP3 anti-bonding MOs. But MO theory tells us that, that that is not the right way to think about that. We have a bonding an MO and an anti-bonding MO that are S in character, and then we have bonding and anti-bonding MOs that are P in character. And there is no mixing of the S and the P orbitals here. So to me, when I think about this language of hybrid molecular orbitals that is very commonly used in many areas of chemistry, to me it's just telling me what orbitals are involved in forming sigma bonds. So when we say that the carbon atom in methane is sp3 hybridized, to me what that means is the s and three of the p orbitals are involved in forming sigma bonds to hydrogen. It does not mean that there is electronically some kind of sp3 hybrid orbital. While we're on the subject of organic chemistry, let's say just a little bit about conjugated pi systems, because those are especially important in materials chemistry. If we were to look at the pi bonding in benzene, uh, here we're looking down on the plane of the benzene ring. So we're seeing one lobe of the p orbital that's on the top of the molecule, and then it's at a slight angle, so we can kind of just see just below it the, the phase of the lobe that's below it. There are six pz orbitals perpendicular to the plane of the molecule, so we can form six pi or pi star MOs from those. That's an important takeaway point from today's lecture. However many atomic orbitals go into a molecule is exactly the same number of the molecular orbitals that come out once we do mixing. We can see intuitively that you have one MO where all of the interactions are bonding, and that's, of course, the lowest energy MO. There is no perpendicular nodal plane here. The only nodal plane is in the plane of the molecule. At the other end, we have this molecular orbital that is anti-bonding between every pair of carbon atoms. So I've drawn in here three perpendicular nodal planes. And of course, that's going to be the most anti-bonding molecular orbital here. And then we have four molecular orbitals that are intermediate. These two that have the label E1G have one perpendicular nodal plane, and they're doubly degenerate. And then the E2U have two perpendicular nodal planes. This set of orbitals is also doubly degenerate. 